So, uh, a confession up front to take care of this, all right? Just learned a valuable lesson. Just want to make sure I pass this on to you. Very valuable lesson. You ready for this? When you're coming into church, don't put a water bottle in your back pocket, all right? Just so you know, I just got to get that out of the way because that's going to show up later on and you're going to wonder what happened. And I got to tell you, that's what happened right there. So, yeah, the Lord keeps me humble. That's for darn sure. But, uh, Hey, so today as we continue on, if you're a first-time guest, let me tell you, welcome to the show. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, today as we go to Philippians chapter 2, uh, here's the question to start with. Who do you like to imitate? Who, who have you imitated, be it in action or uh, in a, a sound, being able to imitate different people throughout the course of history that, uh, that talk different, or, or you can come and try to imitate presidents' voices, things like that. Uh, for me, I remember back to when I was a kid, and as a kid, uh, I would imitate this guy named Michael Jordan, and we were a lot alike. We both had human bodies, and so, uh, or still do, I guess. But I remember in the driveway with my brother Terry, and, and we'd be sitting there, and we'd be, we'd be playing basketball, and I was Michael Jordan and, and doing everything that Michael Jordan could do if he was like four foot nothing and didn't have a lot of skill. And I was doing those things, and my, my brother was Larry Bird. And so we were going back and forth. And, and then we would go into the yard and play football. And in, in football, I would be... Joe Montana. I'd sit there and he'd be Dan Marino of the Miami Dolphins. And Joe Montana was way better. And so I'd sit there and, and sometimes, and this was when I was really imitating people, I, I, I'd do this. I, I, I would sit there and I would hike the ball to Joe Montana, which would be me. And I'd throw it way up in the air and I'd run. And sometime between when I threw it and when I caught it, I became Jerry Rice. And I'd be Jerry Rice and I'd catch it and go for the touchdown. And then there's another one that I, I'm a little more embarrassed to admit, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you just do. I, uh, how many of you had a jacket with all kinds of zippers over it? Uh, it was either black or red. Anybody have one of those? Thank you for the honesty there. You know, I was Michael Jackson, <laughs> right? And I'd be singing the songs, I'd be doing the dances, doing the moves, and uh, you know, you may have some memories like that of people you've imitated through life, but ultimately, today, we're going to be talking about imitating Christ, a worthwhile imitation. You know where all those imitations of Jordan and Montana and Rice and Jackson got me? Absolutely nowhere except embarrassed in front of you today. But imitating Christ, that's what we're called to. Today we're, we're going to be talking to the church, and that's who's supposed to imitate Christ. And when I, when I say church, I want to make sure we all understand who I'm talking about. When I say church, I'm talking about not Riverlawn, not the independent Christian churches, not the American church. I'm talking about the global Big C Church. And to be part of the church, you are unified with Christ. You are a son or daughter of Jesus. You, you come into relationship with him. And here's the, the part that makes you part of the church. It's not coming to this building on Sunday mornings or watching online. What makes you part of the church is when you realize that your sins have separated you from God. And he's righteous and you're unrighteous. And the only way to be back with him is for you to become righteous. But unfortunately, our sin makes us unrighteous. And the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, which is hell, our sins paid for there. But God in his great love and mercy for you and for me and for the rest of the world said, I don't want you to go to hell, I'm going to provide another way. And so he sent his son Jesus, and the Bible says that all of us who call upon him as Lord and Savior, all of us who surrender our lives, confess our sins, and live for him, he takes care of those through the blood on the cross, and we're made righteous through him and get to be with him again. If you've never made that decision, you are, you are lost and you're headed to hell. And we encourage you to text the word FOLLOW to 316-444-4338 uh, to talk to us about what that looks like. We'd love to tell you. So we're talking about the church, how you were, you were to imitate Jesus. You're to follow the example he set forth. To be part of Riverlawn and, and to be part of the actual church here, we have a partnership class, which we encourage you to take part in the next couple months. We're giving away a special gift. You can do that online uh, by video. You can, you can also meet with us here. Uh, find out about that. We'd love to tell you more. But as we talk about the church, the big church, big C church, what we're called to, uh, imitating Jesus, let's jump into Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read the first couple verses. 
Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. In this passage, we're told at the very beginning, Paul says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you're a Christ follower, do you have any encouragement from being united with Christ? That's that's a response. Do you have any encouragement? Okay, good, good, good. Just make sure. If you have any comfort from his love, are you comforted from God's unconditional love? All right, you're there then. And and then if any tenderness and compassion, then there's this if then. and, And Paul says, if you have these things, then make my joy complete by being like minded. If you have these, then do this. It's like if if you're married, if if you love your spouse, you stay faithful. If, If you respect your parents, then you honor and obey them. If then, if then. And so Paul's saying, if you have this, then I want you to be united. I want you to understand that. The church is to have unity. The church is to have unity. We know that. And and Paul is telling us here, and and to the Philippian church, they were having some issues. He even named some names a little bit later on of of some people that were arguing and, and bringing dissension in the church. The church is to have unity because the purpose of unity is that Christ would be glorified and that we would be like-minded. We would would be on the same page with Jesus. We'd have the same love. We'd be one in his spirit. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy the unity in church. The second thing he wants to destroy, the unity in families. And so when we come to the church and what he's trying to do, he has been trying since the beginning to destroy the church. He's been trying in the Old Testament to destroy God's people. And in the New Testament, we see it happening in the church with with the persecution and the things that are coming. And he continues to do that throughout the course of time. If you go online and you Google a church denomination chart, you can see a bunch of different charts. Rose Publishing has a good one that shows you uh, the different breaks that have happened throughout the course of Christianity. Big one happened back in 1054 where the Eastern and Western church split. It was called the Great Schism. And then there's another one where, where we, as we went with the Western church, as far as where we're at today, we went with the Western church in 1517, there was another split. And it was this thing called Protestantism. It's protesting uh, what was being taught in, in the other church that we were part of, the universal church that was before that. That was Martin Luther and Zwingli and different people that helped with the restoration movement and, uh, or the reformation movement. And then we go a little bit further and we see a, a separation in 1536. In 1607, there's an arm of, of Baptists that goes off. And in 1801, there's another arm, Churches of Christ Christian Church. And that's where we uh, broke off from. And it was based upon uh, the Lord's Supper every week and a view of baptism were the two main things where that break came from. You see the course of history, there's denomination after denomination. Even now, Satan is doing a wonderful job of dividing churches. I don't know if you followed church history in the last few years, the last decade. There's been a lot of division in major churches over marriage, over what's acceptable, uh, over who can, who can be a preacher, uh, what kind of lifestyle they can live. There's been a lot of division over uh, politics. There's been division of churches over music style. You know, it, it's, it's crazy. There's been division of churches over carpet color and over if you give goldfish to the kids or not in kids' ministry. It's crazy the, the, the splits that have happened in churches, most of them over preference, right? But Paul says here, if you have any encouragement, this is paraclesis, this is uh, to, to come beside, to, to encourage, to exhort, to walk together. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any unconditional love, that's agape love, if there's any of that, if you're under one spirit, the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, if you have tenderness and compassion, he says, if then you will be united, you will be like-minded. Now, like-mindedness doesn't mean complete agreement okay Uh, god is not calling for us to be clones of each other and what we think and how we act as christians that's not what he's calling us to he's calling us to like-mindedness 
And, and what it means is that we agree on the most important things. We agree with our number one value. The Bible is our final authority. That is so important for us. That we hold true to that. In the, the essentials that Christ is the only way to be saved is huge. Matter of fact, in the restoration movement, which is what happened in 1801, the restoration movement, there's this creed that I love. It says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, music style, preference. Some people like going to a church where, uh, where the pastor is tall, dark, and handsome. Unfortunately, you're not there. It, all these preferences, in, in non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, love. I, I love that creed because it says, in essentials, we're to be unified. In non-essentials, there's liberty. There's, there's freedom to uh, like different colors of carpet. There's freedom to like different music styles. There's freedom to like different things in different ways that aren't essential for salvation. This past week in our small group, uh, someone asked, asked me my end times view. And as I told my end times view, I said, now, just understand, there's four different major end times views, and this is where I land, and, and people that are way smarter than me and know the Bible way better than I do land in different places, but this is what I believe based upon what Scripture says. And ultimately, the end times view you need to have and I need to have is Jesus is coming, so be ready, right? We sum it up. Jesus is coming, so be ready. But I told my end times view... And there's definitely people, even my wife, who didn't necessarily agree with, i got to learn her, but she didn't necessarily agree with everything I was, I was saying from her interpretation of end times. And that's okay. That's okay. We, uh, it, it just means like-mindedness, the, the salvation issues, the most important things. We're to work together as a body and be unified. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. We're to have unity. And, and, and if you don't like the songs that are sung, if you don't like uh, necessarily the way that I preach, if you don't like the way things are done here, you know, most of that is based upon preference, not upon Jesus as the foundation and the word, what we grow upon. And, and those are preferences. And people, uh, you know, I hear, I hear of people leaving Riverlawn. I hear people leaving other church coming. And, and that's just part of the deal. That's fine. But if people ever leave because of salvation issues, then we have trouble with our leadership we're to be unified we're to be like-minded as one body next thing we see in, in philippians 2 verses 3 and 4 do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others above yourselves not look in your own interests, but each to, of you to the interests of the others the church is to have humility the church is to have humility Humility is the opposite of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Selfish ambition, this is that pride thing. Selfish ambition is, uh, it's about me. Selfish ambition is uh, all about uh, my pride, getting what I want. Pride, of course, leads to every sin. Selfish ambition and vain conceit are full of pride. Vain conceit is seeking glory, right? What about me? Look at me. Churches to have humility, selfish ambition, and vain conceit aren't to be there. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 23? For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We're to follow the example of Christ. We're going to read more about him here in verses 5 through 11 in just a second, but we see uh, Jesus' example for us of how to live his life. He, he was God on earth, and, and Mark 10, 45 tells us, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He gave us an example of how to have humility, even though you may think, I deserve more than that. Follow the example of Christ. He told us to put others ahead of ourselves. He calls us to that. Remember John 13? A new command I give you, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We're to show the world that we care about others more than ourselves. Does that mean we don't take care of ourselves? We don't care for ourselves? No, that doesn't mean that at all. Matter of fact, Jesus said, love others as you love yourself. You take care of yourself. Uh, you, you be who God wants you to be. But you love others, and you humble yourself. 
And it's hard. It's hard to be humble because this world teaches it's all about you. What do you want to do? If it feels good, do it. But the churches have humility and, and, and do what God wants us to do, to be praying for, rejoicing, mourning uh, for people. I was just on the phone with two different people in between services that are going through major tragedy in their life. Because as a church, we're, we're to mourn with each other, we're to rejoice with each other, we're to be there for each other, we're to be praying for each other. It's not about taking care of our own interests. It's about caring for the needs of God's people. And you know what's, what's funny is some of you might be thinking this. Some of you might be thinking, oh, I sure hope so-and-so is listening to this. They really need this message. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, I'm going to send them a link to it. No, you're not thinking about anybody else in this message except me, myself, and I. What's God called me to in this? I, I'm called to be humble. I'm called to put others ahead of myself. The early church was a great example of this. And the church in the Middle Ages, as they, uh, they helped in, in towns where everybody else left because of the plague or different things going on, everybody else left, and the church was there and helped. And we're called to do that. Let's look at... Jesus here in verses 5 through 11. First, let's look at 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's huge. That's huge when we think about Jesus. And the church is to follow the example of Jesus. Um, our name, we're Christians, which means little Christ. May we follow the example of Jesus and be who he wants us to be. It's interesting when Paul writes, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus. You know what he actually means there? He means to have the same mindset. And not to have a mindset kind of like. He said, no, you were to have the same mindset as Jesus. Dr. Meyer says, in the whole range of Scripture, this paragraph stands in almost unapproachable and unexampled majesty. We see Jesus from creation to glorification. We see all these things in these few verses here. But, but the most important thing that I want to make sure you understand from the very part of that is, is that he was God. Being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. This is a difference between true Christianity and a lot of cults that are out there. A lot of cults that are out there will say Jesus was a good guy. Jesus did what God wanted him to do. Jesus was the son of the father, but they will not call him God. Jesus was and is God and always will be. We see that from scripture. And this is so important because there's so many different teachings that go away from that. And here's for, for you and, and for me. Well, I'll say for me. I won't put you guys in the same bus, okay? I'm a simpleton. And, and, and sometimes things just blow my mind. Like the fact that Jesus was fully man and fully God, right? How's that work? We know it's true because of Scripture and everything that Scripture has said is true. But sometimes it's hard for us to understand those concepts of the deity of Christ who came and was humble and lived a life serving others and ultimately died for your sins, my sins, the sins of the world. You know, the other thing is the Trinity, which also talks about Jesus being God. So these are some of the hardest things for us to comprehend as followers of Jesus. But we comprehend it by faith. And I want to tell you that it's okay to not totally understand that or get that or wrap our minds around it. Because who wants a God that, that they're like, oh, I can totally explain everything. I, I know everything about God. We are told in Scripture, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Right? Right? I mean, think about creation. How many of us would have thought, well, the plants need to give off something for the humans to survive, and they need to do that. And I mean, the, the whole circle of life and science and all that, it's like, wow. No offense to you and your intellect, because I look around here, and uh, I'm sure through the camera, and there are a ton of very intellectual people sitting in front of me on the camera. But your intellect and my intellect ill in comparison <laughs> the God who created the universe. And so to not totally understand how that, how can he be fully God and fully man? We take it by faith and we trust it. And we know it's true because the scripture says so. 
And if anybody tells you anything different, you need to know that that's an essential that you cannot wait. You can't say, well, that's a non-essential if they don't think Jesus is God. No, Jesus is God. Colossians 2, 9, for in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Doesn't get more clear than that. He humbled himself. Uh, this is part of the scripture actually means he emptied himself. He gave up privileges. He didn't give up deity, but he gave up privileges. J.B. Phillips says he stripped himself of all privilege. He gave up divine glory. He gave up eternal riches. And you know what he gave up most of all, which he longed for most of all once he was here on this earth, is face-to-face relationship with the Father all the time. That's what he gave up. That's what he, that's what he longed for most. That's what he gave up in order to save you and me. In his example of servanthood and humility, he was obedient even to death on the cross, which at the time was the most embarrassing way to die, most disgraceful way to die, most excruciating way to die. He was beaten and put on a cross for my sins and your sins, even though he didn't have to. But he loved you enough. He was humble enough that he did that. It's a beautiful picture. To be like Jesus, we must be about God's glory, not ours. The creator of the world came and, and, and he served mankind. And, and you know, as we look at his example, you know what, uh, what we can look at? He spent a lot of time with the Father. When he was on this earth, he spent a lot of time uh, speaking to the Father, knowing the Father. And if we want to be like Jesus, we need to be spending time with the Father every single day. We need to be in the Word. We need to be praying. We need to be surrounding ourselves with, with, with Christian community. We need to be putting good stuff in our heads. Living in a way that glorifies him. Like Paul, may I be able to say, and may you be able to say, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Man, how are we doing on that, church? It's okay if we haven't uh, batted real well in that up to this point. Today's a new day where we can show the world who he is by the way we live our lives. Let's look at the last few verses here in chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We must surrender to Jesus. The church is to surrender to Jesus. Uh, The word Lord, just so you know, means ruler, master, boss. Ruler, master, boss. The one in charge, the one calling the shots. The church is to surrender to Jesus as Lord. And please don't take offense at this when I say this, but Jesus isn't Lord because you say he's Lord. There's a lot of people who will never say he's Lord on this side of eternity. He's not Lord based upon what we think of him. Jesus is Lord because he's Lord, regardless of what you and I think. He is. We do nothing for his title by saying that we believe it. He's Lord. He's master. He's ruler. And here's a 100% guarantee. 100%. You will bow to Jesus. You will confess him as Lord. It's just if you're going to do it on this side of eternity, on the other side. And let me tell you, there's some perks this side of eternity. If you bow to Jesus now and you confess him as Lord of your life and surrender your life to him, the Bible says your sins are forgiven and you get to be with him forever. But if you're like, man, I I like living for myself. I like where I'm at. I don't need this Jesus stuff. You will bow. He is your Lord, even though you don't know it yet. And when you take your last breath or when Jesus returns, you're going to be on your knees and you're going to confess him as Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me. It is eternally vital that you make that decision now instead of when he returns. A lot of us, we, we want to call Jesus our Savior, and, and he is, and, and that's wonderful, and Savior is so important. But you can't be saved by having a Savior alone. In order to be saved, you have to have him as Savior and Lord. You have to surrender to him. Well, Jeff, I, you know, it doesn't, doesn't call him my Savior. Doesn't that save me? does but there's a follow-up to that it's the lordship of christ see the savior part of jesus that's easy 
That's easy for us because he did all the work. That's easy for us because it didn't cost us anything. We gain everything from what it cost him. But lordship, surrendering to him as Lord, that's a different game. Do you know in the New Testament, Lord is used 747 times? In the book of Acts, where it tells the beginning church and how the Holy Spirit moved in a mighty way, do you know that Savior is used a couple times and Lord is used 92 times? Pretty important for us to understand the role of Jesus in our lives. Savior, absolutely, but without Lord, it doesn't count. You say, oh, Jeff, that's pretty, that's pretty brutal. You can't say that. Uh, scripture doesn't say that. It says anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. You're right. Scripture does say that. You know what else Scripture says? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Did you catch that? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. What? They called him Lord. I can call you president of the United States. Doesn't make you the president. You can call me the greatest preacher you ever heard. Make you a terrible liar. Or a good liar. Calling Jesus Lord doesn't show that we've surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. How we live our lives shows that we're His. How we bow to Him, surrender to Him. There's many people, maybe even sitting here watching online, many people in churches across America who think because they're in a church and because they said some words and maybe got wet that they're okay. That's not how God works, guys. Sorry. Uh, salvation is not something you go and you buy at the store. Salvation is something that was paid for by Jesus, and when you are saved, you live a life different for him. He's the Lord of your life. Many who think they're okay aren't, because they said, Lord, Lord, but they didn't live like it. What is it in your life that you say, you know what? I probably need to surrender this to Jesus. I need to give him this. I need to turn this over. I, I, I need to be faithful to make him Lord of my life. In my personal walk, in my marriage, in my parenting, in the way I treat my, my family, my, my parents, my, my siblings, in the way that I spend my time and what I do with my finances, in the way I talk and what I listen to, what I watch, what is it you're struggling making the Lord of your life in? We need to surrender that and be uh, reminded of what that looks like from four young boys in Sudan years ago. As these older boys were watching and later told the story, they'd been captured by some Islamic extremists. And of the four boys, the youngest one was five, and they were, they were following Jesus, and they had seen their parents die at the hands of these Islamic fighters. And these fighters were punching the boys and kicking them all over the place and telling them they need to recant, and they need to say, Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet, say it. And these boys kept refusing. Even this five-year-old, as, as blood was pouring down their skin, they stayed true to Jesus. And the older teenage boys that have watched it, they had already been laid down on hot coals to try to get them to recant Jesus. They escaped later that night, but these four young Sudanese boys went to be with Jesus when they were beaten to death. <laughs> you, think, you think they're going to hear when they get to heaven? Mm, away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you because you said, Lord, but you didn't live it out. <laughs> nah. <laughs> They're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Come and share in your master's happiness. What will you hear, church? If you're part of the true church, if you truly have surrendered to the lordship of Christ, you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. 
But if you're here in name only, and you said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Man, I made a decision back at camp. I made a decision years ago. And yet you haven't surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Be prepared to hear Jesus say, get away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Church is to surrender to Jesus. We're called to repent. We're called to go to the cross every single day. Remember the example of Jesus daily. Be sorry for our sins. Confess those. Be who he's called us to be. If we are truly his, we will be united under the banner of Christ and the word that he has given us. We will be humble, not about selfish ambition or vain conceit. We'll we'll have the same mind as that of Christ following his example. We'll be who he's called us to be and we'll surrender to him with everything we have. Is that you? If not, today's the day of salvation. Elders and pastors, it'll be down here. You can text the word follow to 316-444-4338 because I can't wait to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. You will bow. Just make it today rather than in eternity. We're going to pray to close, and we're going to do something different to pray to close today according to what we see here in Scripture. If you are physically unable to do this, please don't feel bad at all. You stay, you stay seated at home. Uh, if you can't get on your knees, then you stay seated. But what I want you to do right now, if you would join me in getting on our knees to go to God in prayer to close out our message. If you cannot, do not worry. If you can, let's bow together. Father, we come today, and we want to show you you're the Lord and Savior of our lives. Father, I pray for all of us who have made that decision that we will be working and living towards hearing that well done, good and faithful servant. Not that we work towards salvation, Lord. You accomplished that on the cross. But once we have been saved, then we are to continue to be who you've called us to be. Lord, it's hard. It's tough. But I pray you'd help us to be faithful. Lord, we bow and we confess you as Lord in our lives. Father, for anybody who has not done that, would today be the day where they don't only bow on their knees, but they bow in their heart and, and say yes to you. Father, I pray your church would be the church, that we would be unified and humble, Lord. We'd be following your example, and we'd be totally surrendered. Father, may you find us faithful. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the gift of salvation in Jesus, and that you give us an opportunity to tell others about that. Help us to be faithful in that as well. You're a good God, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.